buddy of mine um, had texted me Nehemiah 6.3. Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem after Jerusalem had just been desolated and wiped out. He was sent back to rebuild the walls. And as he was rebuilding the walls, he had a couple of guys, Sanbias and Tobalat, uh, who, who were um, Sanballat and Tobias. <laughs> anyway, that's only funny to me because I know their names and never mind. Um, they, they were trying to aggravate him and get him not to rebuild the walls. They'd been gone a long time. They had moved in and they didn't want them coming back. And so they were trying to interrupt the process and so much so that all their attempts had failed that now that the walls are nearly uh, finished, um, they say to Nehemiah, come down. Come down here that we might talk to you. Ne Nehemiah knowing, having heard that um, they wanted to kill him. But Nehemiah responded, he said, look, I can't come down. I can't come down because the work that I am doing is too great. What I'm up to is too significant. It is too great, and so I will not come down. I'm going to stand my ground, in other words. And then my friend attached uh, Tom Petty's song, I Won't Back Down, because um, he knows I'm a Tom Petty fan. And so I was like, that's, that's, uh, in Christ, we are going to stand. We're going to stand firm. We're not going to back down because what God has called us to is too great. Leading common people to uncommon life in Jesus is too significant and it's too great for us to get down in the mouth, feel sorry for ourselves, get distracted, worry about external things when the mission that we call to is much greater than ourselves. It's empowered by Christ and so in Christ we are going to stand, right? So every time you hear Tom Petty think, that's right, we're not going to back down. God's got us doing this great and awesome thing. And so we're going to stick with it. Um, the other thing is be careful what you pray for. Um, I've been meeting with other pastors in this city for about uh, a little over a year now, and um, we've been praying for unity. And um, little did I know that uh, God was going to use us to be a way of answering that prayer. We've had over 35 uh, churches reach out and respond just in this city alone um, to help. Matter of fact, this stage and lights and sound system is all a byproduct of um, other churches, Crossbridge, Concordia Lutheran, um, our friends just, just donating stuff and saying here, um, pretty good for, you know, some donated stuff, right? We're doing okay. Um, but it, it's the way for them to serve and help us. We're, we're normally the ones serving. And so it's kind of interesting to be on the other side of it and God's unifying hearts and minds reminding us that it's not Grace Point Church, it's the Church of Jesus Christ in the city of San Antonio, and um, God's doing something way bigger than any one individual church, and we're just glad to be a part of that. So be careful what you pray for. God's moving about accomplishing uh, unity. It's been um, several pastors' uh, heartbeat in this city, and God's bringing that about. The other thing um, is that I just finished the series last weekend in Galatians over at West Campus, and um, I finished the series, Galatians is all about talking about being freed up from the law so that we can live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So all, all throughout the entire um, series, we were talking about what it means to know the Spirit and to hear the Spirit, to discern the Spirit, to walk in the power of the Spirit, how, how life in Christ is not just about Bible studies and small groups and all this kind of stuff. Life in Christ is really ultimately about knowing and discerning the Spirit and following, expressing God's uh, love by faith, by responding in obedience to the Holy Spirit at work in us. And so, um, you know, the, finished preaching, and then I went home, and I was hanging out, and then someone calls me and said, hey, the church is on fire. And so I raced down here, and um, you know, my mind and world just started blowing up and, and spinning. And so that night, as I went to bed, I didn't really sleep, as you can imagine. It's one of those nights where you're laying there with your eyes are closed, and you're kind of in a dreamlike state, but you're really not. Your mind is just working. And as I was working, God reminded me about two weeks prior, during the Galatians series, as I was pre preaching on the Holy Spirit, preaching on keeping in step with the Spirit, keeping on walking in the Spirit, and telling people, this is the life that we were designed for. This is, Galatians is one of the first books of the New Testament ever written. And Paul is telling people, don't you remember what it was like to not have the Holy Spirit? 
And now that you have the Holy Spirit, so they, they didn't even have the Bible. All they had was the Old Testament, um, and th- that Torah was in the temple. It's not like they had, you know, the U version where they could just pull, pull it up on their laptop and go, oh. I mean, they didn't have any of that. And so he's saying, look, you, you remember what life was like before the Holy Spirit. Now that you have the Holy Spirit, why would you go back to that? Why would you go back to the way it was before? And so I was telling believers that that's the life we've been called to live is by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can have an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit where we can discern his voice and we can begin to follow by faith and that's the life we were intended to live. After the service, okay, I'm in this dreamlike state, right? And my mind's working and God reminded me that after that service, a lady walked up to me and she said, Pastor Jeff, this is weird. As you're preaching on that, God put this thing on my heart to tell you and um, so... I'm just going to do it. I'm going to be obedient because um, you were talking about the Holy Spirit and being obedient, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be obedient. And she, she basically, she's prefacing by saying, I don't want to be that weirdo person, but I'm getting ready to be that weirdo, weirdo person. And she said, God gave me a word to tell you. I have no idea what it means, but he told me to tell you wildfire. This is two weeks before. And now I'm in this dreamlike state, and God reminds me, that crazy woman, it really wasn't crazy, but she was just being faithful and obedient to the Holy Spirit that you were preaching on that she should. She came up and told you wildfire and neither of you knew what that meant. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, and it's contrasting the old, old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant that was established by Moses on Mount Sinai, he came down with the the ten laws. And the new covenant established by Jesus, Mount Zion, not not to... He says, okay, in the old covenant, it says this, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Because when God was on Mount Sinai giving Moses the tablets, it says the earth shook. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So once more, God is going to shake heaven and earth. What can be shaken are earthly things. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, meaning the kingdom is spiritual, Jesus says, the kingdom is within. Let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, before Jesus goes up and ascends into heaven, they're asking him about the kingdom. And Jesus says, look, it's not mine to know the day nor the hour. But I tell you this, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, their topic is kingdom, right? Kingdom is not external. It's not an earthly thing. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. These are concentric circles. Jerusalem, San Antonio, Judea, Bear County, okay? Samaria. Samaria were like, you know, not really. So this would be like Oklahoma. And to the uttermost parts of the earth, okay, for y'all from Oklahoma, forgive me. (laughs) Joke at your expense. It's too easy, by the way. Anyway, um, so the power of the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. It's a Greek word, dunamis, it means dynamite, all right? So here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, it's like dynamite. It's an explosion, and it spreads out just like wildfire. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, they were together, fulfilling of what Jesus promised, and suddenly the sound like a blowing of a violent wind came and, from heaven and filled the whole house. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them, and all were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were staying in Jerusalem, but God-fearing Jews from all over the world were there. And they were utterly amazed, and they said, aren't all these Galileans? How is it that each of them hears in our native, how is it that we hear in our native language? 
Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, in other words, people from all over the world that spoke different languages have gathered on Jerusalem for the high holy day of Pentecost, and these Galileans who didn't have, you know, the Rosetta Stone DVD so they could, or CD so they could learn these languages, were all of a sudden empowered to be able to speak these languages because the Holy Spirit of God came down upon them for the purpose of them hearing the good news. And then when they went back to their land, guess what they were going to do? Tell what they had seen and heard. That's called wildfire. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us in power, it spreads. But what it requires is us to be consumed by God. Our God is an all-consuming fire. In order for us to be consumed by God, we have to be consumed with God. We can't live in the power of the Holy Spirit if our eyes and minds are focused on external things because external things can be shaken. That building got shook. But we're not shaken because our kingdom is eternal. That is temporal. How much of your life is obsessed and consumed with things that will burn, things that are shakable? Your job is shakable, your 401k is shakable, your car is shakable, your degree plan is shakable. All of this stuff that we spend the inordinate amount of our time and energy focusing on is shakable. The only thing that is unshakable is that which is eternal. And that which is eternal is manifested, experienced, lived, and produced by the power of the Holy Spirit of God in us. And if we're not walking according to the Spirit, we're producing shakable things. James Bond always orders his martini how? Shaken, Shaken, not stirred. I use that only as a way for you to remember this. (laughs) After a fire, you can have one martini, okay? (laughs) Here's the thing. It should be just the opposite. We should be stirred, not shaken. The Holy Spirit should stir in our spirits And it should produce unshakable things because it's focused on eternal and not external. It's focused on a spiritual kingdom and not the things of this world. And yet we spend so much of our time and so much of our affections and so much of our thoughts on shakable things. We're fixated on possessions. We're fixated on events and circumstances that are trivial And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is work in power through us that wildfire would spread and that the real kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, would spread like that wildfire. I found out this uh, last week that I am um, unfit for jury duty. (laughs) I got a jury duty summons. And... um, you know, so I'm reading the fine print. I'm kind of bummed that, that I got jury duty. I've lived in this town for like 41 years, and um, I've never gotten one before. But it was my time, and I got it. So I'm reading through, and it says, um, if you have a misdemeanor theft, you're ineligible to serve jury duty. Well, I had a pretty colorful high school and college season, in my fraternity life, um, we, we had to acquire certain things. And uh, one of the things I acquired landed me in the Waco uh, jail. So um, I have to go to jury duty. I have to have this thing notarized. So I'm talking to Jean, who works in our office, and she says, Pastor Jeff, don't worry about it. God's got you down there for another reason. You just, you're a missionary down there today. You just go. Don't quit fighting it. Don't worry about it. You just go down there. So I'm going down there. I'm a sea of 300 people. And little Jean, who's about as big as my pinky, I mean, you know, she's 70 and she's like (laughs) preaching to me. You just go down there. You're a missionary down there, Pastor Jeff. And her voice is ringing in my ears. And so I'm going down. I'm saying, God, what are you up to? What are you up to? That's been the thing I've been asking lately. What are you up to? If I just keep that every day, all day, 
What is it that you are up to? Give me spiritual eyes so I can see beyond the externals, so that I can see the spiritual kingdom that's, that's around me. And so I'm sitting there and talking, yakking, just, you know. Then they say, if you've had a misdemeanor theft, you need to go over here. And I'm like, I just told this lady I was a pastor, and now she sees me get up and walk over. And <laughs> so anyway, sure enough, the lady tells me, oh, we're going to have to research this, and, um, but you're dismissed from jury duty today. We might recall you. They did recall me later to tell me that I'm not eligible. Isn't that hilarious? I've never been so glad to be insulted before. <laughs> I do not have the capacity to serve on a Bear County jury because I stole some stuff when I was in college. Anyway, um, <laughs> I've changed. <laughs> so anyway, um, where was I? The point being is I went and I left. And I had some time because my whole day was set aside for jury duty. And my 12-year-old 185,000-mile van had given up the ghost and so we were trying to get a new vehicle and I knew I had to go do the paperwork so I had some time so I went down to the Ford place uh, to do the paperwork but I still have little Jean's voice in my head you just go the missionary God's got something for you today Pastor Jeff so I'm there filling out the paperwork and the guy says to me I see you're a pastor and I said yeah he goes you mind if I ask you a couple questions I was like sure this thing on faith, I mean, I have a hard time with it. We spent a half an hour. And then he interrupts and says, look, I'm at work and I love talking about this. I want to know more. I'm really interested in what you're saying. But would it be okay if we met sometime outside of work so that I could really talk to you about this? I'm like, thank you, Lord, that I am ineligible. <laughs> And that you had a bigger plan for this. And that my stupidity in Waco, Texas in 1987, you somehow are turning into good. Because I landed here. And you've given me eyes to see something. Because I'm getting acquiring a, a material possession. that we get fixated on when we get a new car, right? We're like, it's like a new member of the family and we're all excited about it. And I'm more excited about this thing that you're doing. This, this guy's like a fish who's trying to jump in the boat. I don't even have to cast. <laughs> He's like, hey, can I get on your time? Would it be all right if we met outside of my work so we could talk more about Jesus? Oh, uh, let me check. Yeah, yeah, that'd be all right. I mean, of course. I'm all, how awesome is that? But here's the thing. How easy that would have been able to miss had I been focused on, well, uh, do I get these rims? You know, I mean, we get so focused on external things, things that are going to burn, that we miss out on the true life that God has called us to live. And that is keeping in step with the Holy Spirit every minute and every moment of every day. Because the only thing that is eternal are the fruit that is produced by the Spirit and the souls that will be with you in the kingdom that is to come. That's it. And so if you're not living by the Spirit, you will not produce spiritual fruit, and your world is shakable. The second thing is filled. Ephesians 5, 17 says, Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And you're like, Pastor Jeff, I thought you said we could have one martini. It says, do not be drunk on wine, okay? Bad joke. Here's the point. The point is, do not be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit of God. So some people are such legalists, they're like, see, you can't drink uh, fermented beverages. No, no, he's saying don't be controlled by anything but be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Don't be controlled by alcohol. Don't be controlled by food. Don't be controlled by Game of Thrones. Don't be controlled by, you know what I'm talking about. Your Netflix binge, if it's not Game of Thrones, it's something else. 
Don't be controlled by haagen Don't be controlled. Don't be controlled by anything other. Don't be controlled by anger, bitterness and resentment, anxiety, fear. I'm saying, Pastor Jeff, but I, I have an acute condition of anxiety. I'm not talking about those certain things. So don't, don't feel guilt and judgment. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Some of us got weird temperaments, okay? And uh, you know, some of us are Ferraris and some of us are diesels, okay? So um, th- there's certain things there. But God can have the greatest control and glory in your life when you're controlled by the Holy Spirit regardless of your temperament. That's the point. Don't let any other thing obsess, captivate. What is it that you are obsessing on right now? Is it something that's in your Amazon uh, checkout list? What is it? What's that thing that you wake up thinking about? You're you're working on your your project at work. You're too busy to have a face-to-face conversation with because your big thing at work is what's the most important thing in your life right now because it puts food on the table for your family. No, God puts food on the table table for your family. He just happened to do it through this job that you have, and the job that you have is simply your place where you're supposed to be on mission. Don't let your work get in the way of God's. What? Yeah. What if you just walked into that big project and said, Jesus, what are you up to today? I know I have this deadline, and we're going to meet this deadline, and I'm going to be all about this deadline, but what is it you're up to today? Because the moment that you open your eyes to the spiritual realm where life is, where the spirit is moving and alive and active, he's already up to something. You're just willing to open up to see it. In order to be filled, you must first be emptied. All right? You get it? So, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't be filled with alcohol. You can't be filled with Netflix or halfway filled with uh, anger or halfway filled with whatever it is that you're fixated on. Okay? Well, Pastor Jeff, I've been trying so hard to, I just keep saying, I'm not going to be angry today. Darn it. <laughs> I've tried, Pastor Jeff. I, I've been trying. It was like, Every time, I, I, I promise, I'm never going to click on that website again. I'm done with that. I'm through. And then, like a month later, I find myself doing it. I'm just, oh. Anybody? That was uncomfortable and awkward. Here's the thing. You can't. Evangelicalism is dying because we've been preaching a self-help behavior modification gospel, and that's not the gospel. Behavior modification doesn't work. The more you fixate on flesh, the more you produce flesh. So what's the cure? If you want to be filled with the Spirit, don't focus on, I'm not going to do this anymore. Just focus on the Spirit. Set your eyes above, fix your eyes on the author and the finisher of your faith. Whatever is good and noble and lovely, what, set, think on these things. Be obsessed. If you want to be consumed with God, by God, you must be consumed with God. When he has your heart, when he has your passion, when he is your obsession, when he's the thing you're fixated on, You will be filled up and ignited in power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. The next scripture we read is going to say, and when that ignites, it sets the world on fire. Ephesians 1, 3 says, praise be to God and the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Okay, trace it here. We have received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's an eternal kingdom. It's in the heavenly realms. Flesh produces flesh. Spirit produces spirit. That which is produced by spirit is eternal. It's a heavenly realm thing. So Paul says in verse 18 of Ephesians 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. 
in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his incomparably great power for us who believe, the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, present age, in the present age, he's seated in the heavenly realms above all rule, authority, power, dominion, and name invoked, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich, he made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. In Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What are you, what, what are you saying, Pastor? Here's what I'm saying. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. What are you missing? Go ahead, say it loud. Nothing. Nothing. But the truth is we don't believe that. Because our lives are focused on, on what's missing. Because after all, the television commercial said, we've got to have this. Only for $29.99, you can get one of these. And everybody tells us, hey, oh, I got, you got to try this. Man, dude, you, you're missing out. You got to try this. And we're a consumer culture. We're not to be the consumers. We're to be consumed. Our God is a consuming fire. You are missing nothing. But Pastor Jeff, I just want to be in love. I want a man. I want a woman. I want a... You have everything God wants you to have. And when he wants you to have that, he will provide that. If you go out trying to manufacture that and God hadn't provided, you're going to end up with something that he doesn't want for you and you're going to want to give it back six weeks later after the puppy love had worn off. <laughs> Some of us are trying to force and manipulate things that God doesn't have for us because we don't believe he's given us everything that he's holding back on us. And he's saying, I'm not holding back on anything. There's a will and a way in my timing, but every spiritual blessing is yours. And if you would believe that, you wouldn't be lacking And if you weren't lacking, you wouldn't be trying to fill what you're missing with all these shakable things. Temporary, shakable things. If you truly believe I love you and I poured out every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus and the same power that I used to raise him from the dead now lives inside of you, and you are seated in Christ in the heavenly realms. You're like, no, I'm not. I'm seated right here in these white wedding chairs. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are in Christ. Christ is in heaven. You are seated in the heavenly realms. And all power, authority, and dominion has been placed under him. And you are in him. And the life that you now live, you live by faith in the one who gave himself up for you. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And he lives in me by the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. And anything that is not of and by the Holy Spirit is flesh. And it's external. And it's temporary. And it's shakable. And it's death. But the life that I now live, I live by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is life, which is eternal, which produces dunamis and wildfire. The enemy's greatest lie is to get you to work for what you already possess. Some of you think God is holding out on you, and so you're trying, well, if I do this, and if I, if I listen to the TV preacher, and if I tithe, then his anointing and blessing is going to come back on me. You're already blessed. Why would you read Old Testament passage to try to receive something you've already been given in the New Covenant? The Old Testament's awesome if you read it in context. You are blessed. You're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. 
the enemy's greatest lies to get you to work for that which you already possess, or what he's trying to do is to get you to believe that you're not worthy of receiving that which he's already placed in you. Because you messed up and you weren't good this weekend or you fumbled the ball or you lied or you smoked dope or whatever it is you did. A little girl after the second service, I prayed with her and she couldn't be consumed by God because dot, 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 dot. Little boy I prayed with, will God forgive me for doing this? You're already forgiven, son. You've already been, is Jesus your Lord? Yes. Is he your Savior? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit living in you? Yes. Then you are forgiven, period. Jesus is only going to die once on the cross. And because we believe a different gospel and we don't understand the truth of the gospel, we live on a treadmill of trying to be good enough and we're trying to get and attain that which he's already given to us or we're trying, we're, we're believing that we can't receive it because of something we did. <laughs> if that were the case, we would never have received it. It's not based on our ability or good works. A buddy of mine, I was watching his podcast and he used this illustration, I'm going to steal it. This old man and his wife, they've been married like 50 years, and they're driving in the truck, and he's, he's driving the truck. You know, he's kind of doing this, and she's sitting over by the door. And she says, honey, yeah, baby, you remember when we used to ride in this old truck, and I used to sit right next to you, and we were so in love. Mm-hmm, yeah, I remember. I just, I, whatever happened? And he says, I don't know. I didn't move. Right? And some of us think that God's the problem. That he's holding out because we did something wrong or, or that we weren't, we weren't good enough. Or, or He didn't go anywhere, y'all. He loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. When you received the Holy Spirit by faith and you trusted the life of Christ, he gave you all that you're ever going to get. All you have to do is trust him to walk in it. Life is in the spirit. And if you get your eyes off the shakable things, the things that are going to burn, and you get your eyes back on that which he's provided, which is life in the spirit, and you begin to listen and develop that internal understanding of when the Holy Spirit's nudging you, and you begin to step out in faith and follow him and be the, willing to be the crazy lady. I guarantee you three weeks ago or two weeks ago when she told me wildfire, she didn't expect I'd be preaching on it. She just said, I want to step out and say, I'm willing to be weird. But God told me to tell you wildfire. I don't know what that means. I'm like, mm, I don't either. I do now. It means what God has started here, he wants to spread. And the only way it's going to happen is when Grace Point and the church of San Antonio and the church get their eyes off of shakable, temporary things and start learning to live by and walk by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, which is how we were intended to live. The Spirit of God is our water and we're fish. It's our environment. He's our environment. He's our life. He's our sustenance. He is our everything. And if we don't learn to understand, to discern, and walk by, not just in highlight real moments when we get goosebumps, oh, that song was great. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay. But every minute of every day, what are you up to, God? What are you up to, God? Where are you at work? Tapping into the spiritual realm where every power, authority, and dominion is ours because that's where life is. That's where we are seated. And we can tap into that only by way of relationship with the Spirit. When we start living that way, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be my witnesses. 
Oh, there he goes again with that evangelism. No, here's the thing. When you are dunamis, you are a witness. And the power and the Holy Spirit of God is upon you. And so when you walk in to get a car, all of a sudden, you're not pulling out some spiritual laws and being the awkward guy going, I witnessed everybody. I witnessed a doorpost. I just witnessed everybody. And that's what everybody's supposed to do. When the Holy Spirit of God is upon you, your life is witness. They start jumping in the boat. Hey, uh, can I ask you about that cross you're wearing? Sure. My hope's built on nothing less. Christ alone I stand. And we have the opportunity to share because we're in tune with what God is up to. My hope and my prayer is that what God has started in that building as a physical fire will become a spiritual fire. And that you will no longer be content with this zombie half-life that you've been living, that I've been living. And that we will be consumed by God because we are consumed with God. And we will be filled by the Holy Spirit because our focus and our affection is on nothing else. I'm going to give you a assignment as you walk out today. I dare you to take your spouse or take your family or take your friend, take your small group by the hand and stand out there in that parking lot and ask this question. God, what is in the way of you consuming me? And then say to God this statement. Ask the question, what's in the way? And then say this statement. God, I'm willing. Would you remove and consume me? Because if you're not more in love with God today than you have ever been, he didn't move. Something got in the way. Father, we thank you for we thank you for fire. We thank you for destruction, taking a sledgehammer to the comfortable walls that we surround our lives with in false security. We thank you for shaking things up, Lord God, to refocus our heart's affection and attention and the reality that we are completely and utterly dependent upon you for life. And you are our love. You are our heart's desire, whether we admit it or not. So teach us, Lord God, to be obsessed and consumed with you, that we might be consumed by you, and that that fire would spread. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our prayer team will be down front, and if you want to talk or pray with someone, if you're our guest, maybe you're checking us out because of the fire and the coverage we got, man, we're glad you're here. Fill out a ticket, drop it off at the information center. We want to get to know you. If you're just here for the weekend, great. But if you're thinking about making Grace Point your home, that's a great way to get connected. Also, don't forget, um, next weekend, uh, the 3rd, we are celebrating Pastor Kyle and Steph. Pastor Kyle and Steph, for those of you who weren't here last uh, week, they've taken a church in Ohio. He's going to become the senior pastor of a church in Ohio and while it breaks our heart, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt it's God's will. And so we're going to be celebrating them in the evening, 5 to 7, right here, July 3rd. We love you guys. Facebook Live, love y'all. And uh, go out and spread that fire. Take care. You have an assignment in the parking lot, don't forget.